I'm Karim Fizazi, medical oncologist at Gustave Rossi in Villeneuve, France, and I'm here in Madrid during uh, this ESMO 2017 meeting uh, for this uh, e-cancer event. And we, today we will speak about prostate cancer and mostly, of course, what was uh, presented here at the Congress. I'm uh, glad to have a very nice uh, faculty uh, panel together with me including uh, Professor Stéphane Houdard from uh, Paris, uh, Georges Pompidou. Uh, we have also uh, Professor Bertrand Tombal from Brussels, a, a urologist, and also Professor Maria De Santis from the UK University of Warwick, medical oncologist, as uh, Stéphane. Most of what we're going to discuss today is going to be about prostate cancer, and I have to say it's going to be mostly about metastatic prostate cancer. And this is because we had uh, new data uh, recently uh, during the Congress, but also in the last uh, two or three years. And all patterns of treatment are really evolving rapidly. So, Stefan, just to get started, um, regarding the uh, castration-sensitive metastatic situation, I guess it's fair to say that there are two uh, standards of care that are emerging on top of classical ADT the Staxel and uh, Abiraturin. And a big question uh, for all our colleagues soon, if Abiraturin is approved in this indication, will be which one should they choose? Here at ESMO, we had some data presented by the Stampit group comparing directly the two treatments. Can you please elaborate on that? Yes, you know, Claire Valls, you know, uh, firstly presented, you know, data about the different randomized clinical trial from the Stampid, you know, uh, studies uh, looking at the different, you know, situation ADT with different drugs, you know, and she found out that in fact the two drugs which are the best in combination with ADT is ADT with docetaxel or ADT plus abiraterone. And she found by doing a, a network analysis that in fact, you know, the best one, the best combination is ADT plus uh, abiraterone leading to a 93% probability of good outcome. And she said that the second, you know, uh, choice would be to look at ADT plus Ocetaxel leading to a 43% probability of good outcome. So, uh, but she, she made this study not on the individual patient population and characteristic, you know, and I, I think that there is two uh, major uh, problem for this, you know, uh, analysis because she did not take into account you know, the tumor burden of uh, the, the different uh, uh, clinical trials. So, and as you know, in, in the, the shorter trial and the, in the Stampede trial, that we, have, we have a much higher tumor burden than in the GTUC15 trial, for instance, mm -hmm. so it's difficult to compare. And in addition to that, she didn't look at you know, secondary uh, treatments. Uh, at relapse, you know, so it's difficult just to, to give you know, an answer about which drug is the best in fact. On the top of that, uh, uh, the first day, uh, Matt decided to look at the uh, uh, retro effect between abiraterone uh, plus ADT or ADT plus, plus, uh, plus uh, docetaxel. And he wanted to make a clear analysis, you know, going from, you know, uh, failure free survival to metastatic free survival to us to OS. And he found that maybe there is a trend towards better efficacy if you look at, if you look at ADT plus AB in terms of metastatic free survival. But if you look at OS, you know, data, uh, he found that there is no difference at all, in fact. So I think that right. we can't say anything, we, can, we cannot recommend anything to, to our clinician and to our patient uh, about you know, which treatment is the best so far. All right, so it's probably fair to say that we have plus or minus two standards of care at the, at the moment. Um, Bertrand, there were data presented at the Congress regarding the latitude trial and the patient reported outcome. And I think that's very important on top of duration of life and extension of, of the duration of life. Can, can you tell us more about it? So indeed, it was the, probably one of the most important missing piece of the puzzle because as Stefan just explained, uh, when you compare docetaxel to abiraterone, you see that uh, because of its mode of action, it's delaying, it's delaying progression extremely efficiently. But th the question is, what life do we offer to this patient? And after uh, your presentation at ASCO, there was a lot of uh, what I would even call bashing about the fact that there is corticoids, that they're going to have a lot of toxicity, that it's going to deteriorate their quality of life. So they were. Uh, a lot of questions, and actually Kim Shi presented the, uh, uh, 
the patient reported outcome, so basically standard assessment of quality of life, and basically made two observations. The first one is that, as we know, urologists from old trial, patients on ADT with high volume cancer, they deteriorate extremely rapidly. And uh, in contrast to what is always said, ADT alone doesn't have a major effect on quality of life, or if it has one, it is very, very short. And although it's difficult to distinguish from uh, cancer progression, the benefit is not used. And what you see is that when you combine to uh, abirateron, you have a major and sustained benefit in quality of life. Uh, once again, the time quality of life deteriorate is difficult to uh, differentiate from clinical progression, but it should reassure all that said that uh, when you had a corticoid, actually you have a, neg a negative impact on quality of life. We don't see any of this. And if you take an instrument, which for us European is extremely important, which is the EQ5D, because this is what our health economists are going to use to justify that expensive money. When you look at uh, the, the health status impact on EQ5D, it is really dramatic. So, uh, so, so basically, that would help. It's fair to say that Abiratron not only postpone death in the setting, but also improves pain, fatigue, and quality of life. Major which impact, is just, yeah. which is just great. Now, at the end of the day, should we, or at least in the future, should we keep using two treatments, ADT dostaxel or ADT Abiratron, or should we combine everything all together? like it is currently tested in the PS1 trial or in the Arasens trial. Can you elaborate on Arasens, for example? So, uh, if once again you refer to uh, Stefan's presentation, he showed a, a nice graph on John Isaacs, showing that actually uh, progression, it's a mix of adaptation and clonal uh, progression. So, it makes sense from the physiological standpoint to combine the two treatments, but it needs to be tested in clinical trial. Uh, there are trials, like PEACE-1 or Enzamet, for instance, where they have been all arches, the enzalutamide trial, that will give the possibility of adding docetaxel or not. So it may still not fully answer the question. That's why Arasens uh, was developed. And uh, the idea that we're going to design a trial where everybody will receive docetaxel. So the entry point is not ADT anymore, it is ADT plus docetaxel. So you may argue that you're gonna select a population of patients that are fit for docetaxel, but that's the population. And on top of that, we are adding a new uh, AR pathway inhibitor, which in this case is ODM201 or uh, darolutamide. Right. So that's what we expect to see in this triple combination. The benefit of adding AR pathway inhibitor on docetaxel. Yeah, no, I think the, these questions are really key because it really has the potential to even increase again the duration and, and quality of life. Maria, in, in Stampede, actually not all patients are metastatic, so we do have data of abiratron or ADT plus or minus abiratron in patients with non-metastatic disease and some data were presented here at ESMO. Can you summarize that to us? Well, yes, but let me start with uh, praising the trial design of Stampede because it is really, um, it um, is different from the other randomized controlled trials that only included the M1 population. In Stampede, about 40% of patients had no metastatic disease but high risk features uh, that made them eligible for the trial. And in those patients, the trial protocol um, with regards to the abiraterone arm, for example, was uh, different from the metastatic arm because the patients included with M0 disease received abiraterone for only two years, so limited uh, treatment burden compared to the metastatic patient population. In addition, those patients in the Stampede trial, which is a multi-arm and uh, uh, multi-stage design, in, in this trial also uh, patients were randomized to receive uh, treatment of the uh, radiotherapy treatment of the uh, local disease. So uh, we have very different aspects uh, looked at in this randomized controlled trial. So as for the M0 population, uh, for the endpoint failure-free survival, there was a huge benefit uh, with regards to the hazard ratio in favor of treating the patients uh, um, 
with uh, abiratron and not only with standard of care, so adding uh, treatment in those patients for the two years. And this was also uh, significantly positive for the metastatic uh, uh, failure-free survival. For the overall survival, uh, we assume a, a benefit, but uh, still um, it is maybe early days and maybe those patients will have uh, so few uh, events that we will uh, never see the true uh, overall survival benefit because they might even be cured. So basically, based on this data and you work in the UK, do you think we have a new emerging standard of care for these men or should we wait for more data, longer follow-up? time to metastasis, and as you said, maybe overall survival in the long term before using a bit of in high-risk localized disease? What do you think? So this is uh, difficult to answer because uh, um, there is no nice approval so far for the use of abiratron in that setting, uh, neither for the metastatic patients nor for the M0 patients. Um, but, um, I think from the medical oncologist's point of view and seeing all those patients and seeing the great results and being assured that uh, the quality of life and the treatment burden is actually not as bad as, we, as was anticipated, I think it would make uh, sense, definitely sense, to treat those patients early on um, and maybe cure the patients or really provide very long-term survival without uh, progression. And I think these uh, endpoints are really important for the patients not progressing with PSA, not progressing to metastatic disease and not being in need of additional treatment. All right, okay. So I guess we, we, we need probably still a longer follow-up to, to use that as a standard of care, but, but the signal is obviously very, very good and very strong at this moment. Stefan, in prostate cancer, we do have a very specific situation which you know, in, in the middle of localized disease and metastatic disease, which not, not necessarily exists in other cancers. And it's really the rising PSA setting where you don't see where the disease is located, but you know it's progressing. And you have been able to conduct a randomized trial testing the stack cell in the setting on top of ADT. You just presented the data here at ESMO. Can you summarize that for us, please? Well, when you speak about rising PSA, you know, the first rising PSA, in fact, you know, the tumor burden is really uh, uh, low. In fact, uh, you are dealing you know, with uh, uh, circulating tumor cells and maybe you know, micrometastasis that you can see at the imaging so far. So it was a study which, was, uh, 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 which began in uh, 2003, so a long time ago. And the objective was to see whether or not we can increase you know, the PSA-PFS with ADT plus Ocetaxel compared to ADT alone. So we included 250 patients in this study, and at the end, you know, in fact, there is a trend toward a better efficacy in terms of PSA-PFS, but what is the meaning of PSA-PFS you know, in this setting? It was a long time ago, in favor of ADT plus Ocetaxel uh, regarding all the patient characteristics. But you know, the p-value was not significant, and when you look at the RPFS on the rest, there is no difference so far. So maybe at this stage of this disease, you know, maybe you know, if, you, if you use uh, hormonal therapies, maybe uh, enough, I would say, uh, um, uh, <coughs> at, at, at least you know, that it that doesn't add anything on the top of uh, IDT. But in this patient population, you know, we have a very good outcome in terms of uh, 10 years of all survival. 70% of the patients were uh, free of disease at this stage. So the, 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 the question is, do we need to treat those patients with ADT? So, you know, going back, you know, to the opposite you know, side, saying that maybe for some patients we don't need to do anything. You should follow them. Yes, and probably this is also based on PSA doubling time, as we all, all know, to try to better select all, all the patients for intervention versus surveillance. Now, I guess one striking thing that is emerging for prostate cancer patients is the DNA repair question or DNA repair and defect questions. So a subpopulation of all the patients have either germline or somatic DNA repair genes abnormalities that make their cancer different and also that make potentially their families different. So Bertrand, can you, can you summarize where we currently stand and what we've learned here at ESMO regarding this? So in a nutshell, we have two information. The first one is that even in high-risk localized disease, you can spot some of these patients. As we know from more Ross Hill UK trial, we have a better idea of the usual suspect, BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, CHECK2, but there are many others DNA repair mutations involved. 
that the patient who have this mutation clearly have a worse prognosis. Does it enough? Is it enough to change the treatment today? The answer is no. It was clear from the Spanish trial. They still respond very well to ADT, surgery, radiotherapy, and zalutamide, abirateo. So come the question, when should we look at it? Outside a clear family history, but that's where we have to teach medical oncologists and neurologists to do a, medical, a proper medical history. We are waiting from guidelines from NCCN to see exactly what should we check. Then, second information, when the patient is progressing on ENSA, on ABI, after docetaxel, we must um, get used to check for somatic mutation because when patient has DNA repair <coughs> mutation, there is and there will be therapeutic opportunity. And not only PARP inhibitor, it's very hype, but also um, platinum compound. So this is where we are today, but it's moving very, very rapidly. And we need to learn about this, and we need to learn more about doing proper uh, genetic history of our patient. Absolutely. There are actually quite large programs starting or already started with PARP inhibitors, and as you said, also with some, some platin uh, trials ongoing. Um, I guess here at ESMO, uh, Maria, we had some presentation regarding the large uh, Triton uh, program with a Craparib. C can you tell, tell us what that is? Uh, well, the uh, uh, Triton program um, follows uh, the knowledge uh, that uh, Bertrand was just explaining. Uh, we have seen preliminary evidence that patients with DNA repair deficiencies respond uh, better to PARP inhibitors than those who have not. Um, this was linked to BRCA1, 2 and, and to ATM aberrations, but uh, there are also other genes that might uh, make the patients more uh, eligible for this kind of uh, um, treatment with uh, PARP inhibitors. Um, there are uh, several PARP inhibitors uh, out there, and the Triton program uh, uses Recuperib. Um, the Triton 2 is a phase two trial. Uh, it looks at the usual uh, BRCA1 to ATM and a 12 panel uh, gene with uh, other aberrations, um, selects the patients and uh, treats the patients with the endpoint uh, response rate. Um, so resist response or PSA response, just uh, a signal finding uh, study I would interpret it. Um, the other larger uh, program is a randomized phase three trial again using Rucaparib. And this is a trial in uh, patients that progressed on AR uh, inhibitor uh, treatment, like abiraterone and salutamide. This, these patients uh, should not have been pretreated with docetaxel. Those patients would be excluded. And uh, this, uh, the patients get randomized to receive either Rucaparib in this situation or investigators choice uh, uh, treatment with abiraterone and salutamide or chemotherapy with docetaxel. The end point here is radiographic progression-free survival, which I think makes uh, sense because uh, um, there is a good link, and this has been shown in the, and published recently, good link between radiographic progression-free survival and overall survival, and I think we need a more immediate end point here. Right, absolutely. And I guess, I mean, Triton is one of the programs, the large programs that we have at the moment with, with PARP inhibition. Uh, there are others, which is just great for all the patients because it really provides them an opportunity to receive one of these agents. We don't really know whether one is better than the other one, to be honest, regarding the PARP inhibitors. But really having several programs running in parallel really provides an opportunity for, for patients to get at least one, uh, which is probably very important to them. So I think we, we covered uh, plus or minus the big news that we had here at ASMO 2017 regarding prostate cancer. Uh, I would like to, to thank you for this conversation. It was fun doing that together. And really, we see major progresses, congresses after congresses in prostate cancer in the last years. It's really fantastic. So I'm, I'm glad we, we're here to summarize that. Uh, finally, I would just like to, to thank you for attending this eCancer event. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.